I think sometimes we just forget how good God is, and I think we forget uh, how he's working, how he's working in our lives, how he's working around uh, through those and, and to those around us. And uh, it's just things like that are just really, really hard, and I think people sometimes don't understand uh, how hard it really is and what's what, what people go through. So, all right, we're going to uh, be reading out of Philippians this morning and just going to uh, cruise through some scriptures and we're starting in uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. And Paul's writing to the Philippian church and uh, in there he says, in three, in one three he says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you making my prayer with joy, because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ of Jesus Christ. And so I just want people to be encouraged. I want people to know that when God has put something on your life, when God has put something in your life, I think so many times we get wrapped up in what's going on around us. We get wrapped up in the circumstances we're in. We get wrapped up in what's going on in the nation around us, in our families, in our job situations, in our school situations. We just get wrapped up and... When that happens, we lose sight of what God has said about us, what God has said to us, and what God wants to do through us. And I, I want to encourage everybody, just like Paul was saying here, that he's sure of this one thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And so many times we think, I bet you if I ask people around across the room here, Almost everybody would be able to say, there's been times when you just have said to yourself, or maybe out loud, or maybe to others, I missed it. God can't do this anymore. Why? Because I missed it. I got out ahead of him, or I got behind him, and I didn't go when he told me to go. And we're thinking that we missed it. But I want to point out what Paul was saying here, that he who began the good work in you is going to be the one that completes it. We need to allow him the space in our life. We need to allow him the ability to come into our life and complete it. And I got to tell you, is God does know the end from the beginning. And I don't want to get into the nuances where people go in all crazy directions. But the reality is God already knows when we're going to fail. God already knows what we need to learn through the circumstances where we got out ahead of him, where we didn't step out when he told us to step out. He knows all those circumstances. And in that, he is still going to complete what he wants us to do if we allow him to. The enemy wants us to give up. The enemy wants us to back off. The enemy doesn't want us to step into the fullness of what God has. He wants to keep reminding us of everywhere we failed, everywhere we've fallen short, everywhere that, that we supposedly have let God down. But in Romans, it tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, not even one. We need to remember that he who began that good work in us is going to be the one that completes it. If you don't get anything else from today, I just pray that you get that one thing. We're going to jump forward to uh, verse 18 in chapter 1. And Paul says, Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through our prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He's talking about he was in bondage and they were all worried about him and they were worried that he was in prison and they were worried of what was going on. But he's saying, You know what? Through prayers and the help of Jesus, it's all going to turn out for my deliverance. 
Verse 20 says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether in life or by death. I want you to think about this for a minute. Paul is in prison. All these people are looking up to Paul like, this is Paul, the great apostle. This is Paul who we're following. This is Paul, our leader. This is Paul who has brought us so much. This is Paul who helped us plant our church. This is Paul who's been there to encourage us, that's helped keep us on track. And at this point in time, they're looking at Paul, and Paul is in chains. And I guarantee you, it doesn't take a stretch of the scripture. It doesn't take bending. People there were totally distraught. Why? Because the one they put all their faith in was now in prison. And how is he going to help us? And, and if he ended up there, what's going to happen to us? We're nothing like Paul. We don't have the faith of Paul. We don't have the words of Paul. We don't have the strength of Paul. He's been our anchor and now he's in jail. And they're probably going to kill him, or he's never going to get out. That's why we can't put our faith in people. We can still be a part of a body. We can still be a part of, of, of a family of God. We can still be an active participant. But you know what? When we start putting people above God then it's so easy to get disappointed. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to get pulled off course. And Paul's saying, you know what? I don't care if I live or if I die. I'm still doing what God called me to do. I don't look at this as a setback. I look at this as there must be another opportunity or another lesson to be learned here. We got to shift our minds. We got to step out of where we are and we need to start looking at what is God doing in these circumstances. See, Paul wasn't focused on how much food he got. He wasn't focused on how bad the prison was. He wasn't focused on the guards. He wasn't focused on, on the, the wickedness or the distress of the other people there with him, the other prisoners. Paul was saying, through all this, God has a purpose, and I'm going to focus on what God's purpose is, and I'm not going to focus on the circumstances. It doesn't matter if I die here. I'm going to die for a reason. I'm going to die in the center of God's will. Sometimes we think because things are going on that God has left. That's not true. Sometimes we've made a wrong turn and we end up in bad circumstances. It doesn't mean God left us. It made, means we made a bad turn. And sometimes we can get distraught. One time, it was actually two weeks before we started the church. We were going to a pastor's conference in uh, Toronto, Canada. And we flew into uh, Detroit. We rented a car. And we were going to drive up to uh, London, Ontario, and do an outreach and then go on to Toronto. Well, you know, I've been a lot of places, and we just decided when we were driving around Detroit that day, we got off the highway on this exit because you know what? On every exit of the highway, there's usually a store and a gas station, and we wanted to get some stuff before we crossed over the border. And when we got off the highway, there was no on-ramp. And when we got off the highway, there was no gas station. There were cars that were burnt. All the houses had all the windows broken out of. We didn't have a GPS phone. And all of a sudden, you're in another city. <laughs> Look like the pictures you see of Afghanistan. There wasn't one house that wasn't boarded up or burnt or had windows left in it for blocks and blocks and blocks. Everything parked on the street was totally destroyed and tagged up. 
then every once in a while you'd see a really fancy Lincoln Continental or a Cadillac driving through and we're trying to figure out how do we get back on the highway. See, it's so easy in those circumstances to get distraught because we get wrapped up in what's going on around us. We get wrapped up in the reality that we made a wrong turn and we have no idea how to get back on the highway. That's the way it is in our own life. Literally about 40 minutes later, we found, I kept driving where we could just see the highway and kept going back and back and back until we found an on-ramp and then said, we're not stopping until we're well in Canada. <laughs> See, God's always going to deliver us. There's always a way. You can stop and get distraught. We can swim upstream. I honestly thought about going back down the exit we came to, but then I didn't remember how we got on. <laughs> How we got off the highway, I didn't know how to go back to there. See, God has a plan for us. And he's going to complete it if we just allow him. If we stop focusing on what's going on around us. And that's what the enemy wants right now. In verse 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two because my desire is to depart and be a part with Christ, for it is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause of joy in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You know what Paul says? I've already done all this stuff for God. I know that I know that I know that if I go today, if I die in jail, if they bring me up and they execute me, if another, if another prisoner kills me, if a guard kills me, I already know where I'm going, and that wouldn't be a bad thing right now. I, I think he was being in reality, you know, you're not here. You're not chained in a dirt floor. You're not here. But for me, to die is gain because I go straight from here to paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I step out of this place and I'll be right before my Savior. I'll be praising God with the heavenly host. And he goes, I'm more than happy to do that. But he goes, I don't really want to do that. Why? For your sake, not for my sake. How many of us are crying out for God to come back today? I don't want to live in this political climate. I don't want to live in this world climate. I don't want to live because of this. I, I would just want you to come back. When I first got saved in 88, Everybody was, Jesus is coming back, and prayer meeting after prayer meeting, praying, come soon, Lord Jesus. You know what I've learned since that time is? I'm not ready for Jesus to come back because I have too many family members. I have too many neighbors. I have too many coworkers. I have too many wicked people that I see every day that don't know Jesus. And me, just like Paul, if I die today, I already know where I'm going. But I want to keep going because I don't want to see the people around me die without knowing him. And sometimes we don't know who's going to live and who's going to die when. We just did a funeral for somebody that just passed away at 42. We did that yesterday, and they were a total atheist, and then they wanted some help. His wife was getting help, and he wanted some help to get out of addiction. And just right here in December, was it after Christmas or right before? 
It was after Christmas. He came to Rich. Rich was talking to him in his house. He fell down on his knees, and he says, you know what? I need help. I, I'm surrendering all. And he gave his life to Jesus, and then... <laughs> then, to be real honest, trying to stop his addiction took him to be with the Lord. We don't have time for that. We don't have time for those people. We don't have time for people that speak against us. We don't have time for people that are going against the grain. We don't, you know what? If they're speaking against us, then they deserve what they get. That's what some of us think. If they don't listen to the way we believe, if they're not listening to the scriptures we're sharing, if they're not following our example, then so be it. But you know, that wasn't the case. When he called, Rich dropped what he has, what he had going on in his life, and he went. And this was a man that was very vocal against church. He was very vocal against what was going on. But you know what? When the time came and the chips were down, everything Rich had on his plate went out the window, and he went, and some people say, now what did that profit? It profited everything for that man. He left behind two daughters who had become Christian before that had been praying for their dad, and he wasn't listening to them, and now they know that they know that they're going to see their dad again, and he didn't go. See, for us to live is gain for him. It's not a time to be praying, come soon, Lord Jesus. It's a time to be praying, who do we need to drop everything for? Verse 27 says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or I am absent... I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened by anything by our opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction. Clear sign of them of their destruction, but your salvation from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now here I still have. Paul was saying, you see, I'm in the same conflict. Sometimes we lift people up and, and we think, oh, that person's a pastor. Oh, that person's a leader. Or, oh, that person's doing this ministry. Or, oh, God's using them. Paul's saying, you know what? I have the same struggles. I have the same struggles that you have. It's just how I handle them. It's just how, how I address them. That's what makes the difference. You know what? It's what we're focused on that makes the difference. I ride a motorcycle, and after I read this book, <laughs> just talking about... Uh, to how to ride. It was, a, it was a really old book. There was a gentleman that went to our church that uh, had loaned it to me. And when you actually read it, if you've ever seen somebody like ride through the cones, it looks really easy but until you go try and do it. It's not easy. What they said is, you don't focus on where you're going. You don't focus on the cone. You focus on the point out front. This is where I need to end up. And even when you're taking big corners, even when you're driving in the mountains, if you're focused way out ahead of yourself and you already know where you're going to turn, everything else just follows. Our problem in life is right now and today, we're all focused down like this. We're focused on 
I can't do this and I can't do this because of COVID and I can't do this because of my limited ability and I, I can't do this because I don't have the money and I can't do this because I don't have the training. I can't do what others do. But the reality is we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The reality is he's working out what he's called us to do. And we're focused on every little thing. Just like I was talking about last week, we're focused on all the giants in the land. We're focused on all the, all the walled cities. We're focused on the armies. We're focused on how everything is fortified. And he's saying, but you know what? I've given you all this. It's all yours. And the great part is, just because he's given us something doesn't mean he has to wipe out everything else. We can go in and be the element of change. Isn't that what God's calling us to do? I don't care how many executive orders the president signs. I don't care what the Republicans or what the Democrats are doing, and I'm not saying that in a carte blanche, they can just do whatever they want. I'm just saying is God is still in control at the end of the day. If they close down all businesses, God is still going to provide for me. If they take away all my water, he's going to make water come out of my sidewalk. That's what I'm saying is we, we need to be trusting in God and not worried about how to walk this out. We need to be trusting in God and not worry about all the obstacles that are thrown up against us because you'll see. Just think about all the examples oh, we don't want this man to pray, so let's just make a law. Oh, he broke the law. Let's throw him in the lion's den. And what happens? Yes. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> God gave him appetite suppressants. <laughs> but the one who provoked to make the law, when he went in, they were plenty hungry. See, they get devoured by their own devices. And I got to tell you is, we can choose to focus on all those things, but I'm going to tell you, right now, we're living in this great opportunity of sharing the gospel. We're living in this great opportunity of being able to show a difference. We're living in this great opportunity to be the people God called us to be. You'll also notice when Paul got out, Paul didn't start a foundation for save the prisoners or give the prisoners, uh, let's increase uh, the way prisoners are treated. Let's change these rules. He wasn't doing that. When, when he got out, the first thing he did is just what he was doing before he went in. It didn't change what he was doing. Why? Because God's call didn't change. And I'm not saying God hasn't put things like that on people's hearts, but you know what? Just because we end up in a circumstance doesn't all of a sudden mean we become an advocate for that circumstance necessarily. We need to be doing what God has called each and every one of us to do, and we need to fully understand that he's going to complete it. We need to be stepping out. We need to be walking it out. Do you even realize how many churches just in our area are closed? How many churches will never open back up? How many buildings are now sitting empty when a church couldn't get a building a year ago? See, the enemy's playing that poker game and he's bluffing people and they're shutting their doors. He's bluffing people and they're saying, we can't, we can't, we can't. And God says, through me, all things are possible. 
And I'm not saying everybody has to follow in our example, but you know what? He's made a way for all things to be possible. You can be on Zoom. You can be on home groups. You can, there, there's so many different ways that you can still keep going. And I'm not, we're just doing what God has called us specifically to do in this time, in this day, in this season. But I'm going to tell you, is God's plan does not stop because COVID comes. God's plan does not stop because the government says stop. I got to tell you, I've ministered to people from China. I've ministered to people from Laos. We've been in Burma where they're killing pastors. And you know what? They don't care. <laughs> they're not worried about who's going to come in and kill them. They're worried about who's going to take our place if they come and kill me. We're worried about, are they going to give us a ticket? And they're worried about who are we training up because it probably is inevitable that they're going to come and take us out. So how many are we training up? How can we disperse this? How can we keep the gospel going forward? How can we keep the vision that God has given us corporately moving forward? And how can we keep encouraging everybody to walk in what God's called them to do? And you know what? It's no different for us here. We need to be walking out what God's called us to do. We can't stop because of situations. We can't stop because of governments. We can't stop because of people. We can't stop because of sickness and disease. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you... Look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count an equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on him the name that is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the glory of the Father. It's not a time to be talking against those who are taking different approaches. We did a memorial service yesterday for that man, and most of his family wants nothing to do with Christianity. The parents were not even going to come to his service because... We were not making it mandatory that everybody wear masks and everybody. But you know what? We just geared up half the sanctuary and those people that, that came that were of that mindset, some of which haven't left their house in nine months. We can't deprive them because of our own beliefs. We can't deprive them because of what we're doing. You know what? It was out of love and respect for them that we met them right where they were. I can tell you, they were, they were totally in shock at the way we accommodated them. But I can tell you, talking to them, that's not the way other Christians, that's not the way other people have treated them at all, and they were expecting the absolute worst. And they ended up far above and beyond what they expected. Why? Because we love them right where they're at. 
Church, I want you to wake up and realize it's not our job to change people. We're supposed to be fishers of men, not the cleaners of the fish. And we spend so much time telling people where they're missing the boat instead of just loving them right where they're at. Christ loved me where I was at. He loved me right where I was at. He loved me the way I dressed. He loved me the way I talked. He loved me the way I lived. When I showed up at church, everybody said I had to cut my hair or I wasn't going into heaven. It was an upper middle class church. Everybody wore suits. I mean, I've shared this before. There was two of us in the whole church of 5,000 people that had long hair, two guys. And every week for years, we heard that we're not going to go to heaven until we cut our hair. God could care less about my hair. He cared about what he was doing in me. I'm just sharing that. Why? Because we all sitting in this room at some point in time have done that to somebody. You know you can't go to heaven if you keep talking like that. You can't go to heaven if you're smoking. You can't go to heaven if you're living with somebody and you're not married. You can't go to heaven if you're working at that kind of a place. You can't go to heaven if you're working at a dispensary. God will work out all that stuff. That's not our job to point it out. I want to tell you, do you think people don't know what their shortcomings are? Do you think people don't know what their demons are? Do you think people don't know where their pain's coming from? We don't need to remind them of that. We need to remind them and we need to show them that God loves them right where they're at. After Russ Frey's passed away, I was, uh, they were asking for pictures and stuff for the funeral, and they were asking for some video clips, and there's this beautiful new feature, I don't know how long ago they added it to your iPhone photos, but you can actually bring up a map of the world and you can click right where you were. And I don't remember all the dates, but I remember places I was with Russ. And I was able to click on Sierra Leone and 480 pictures of our trip there. And I was able to click on Vietnam and I was able to click on Thailand and on and in Chiang Mai, Thailand and in Chiang Rai, Thailand. And I was able to click on Burma and I was able to click on all these places we went. And as I was going through pictures and just seeing the things God did in all those places, even in Frederick, even here, being able to click and just see and just remember the things that went on. All of you have heard me share that, you know, Sierra Leone was probably the most dangerous, craziest place I've ever been before in my whole entire life. I've been in the subways in New York in the middle of the night. I've been all kinds of places in the world, and I've never been, I never thought I was going to die every day like I did when I was there. Every day was a throw of the dice, literally. I said, man, I don't know if I could ever go back. And as I was looking through the pictures, and then it just so happened because he had passed away, the, the pastors we were there with, they were messaging me, and they were asking me how I was doing, and I was asking them how they were doing, and we were just talking about that trip, and God reminded me when I very first got saved. There was a man, Francis Infuso, came, and he did a, a conference there on spirit-led evangelism and how to hand out tracts, and that was really big back then, and he worked for Christian Equippers, and they had all these crazy tracts. But that very first night, he said, anybody that wants a word from the Lord, just come forward. And I thought, hey, it'd kind of be cool if God talked to me. And I went forward with 
about three or 400 other people. And he made his way through the crowd and, and he laid his hand on me and he started prophesying over me and I had no idea what was going on. All I knew is that I instantly started shaking. I instantly started crying. I instantly was overwhelmed. I, I was hearing what he was saying, but I had no idea the ramifications of what was happening at that moment in time. But he said, I was like a wild seed cast off to the side, left for good for nothing. But God had kept his hand upon me. And then he was going to, that I was like a wild stallion and he was going to put a bit and a brace in my mouth and he was going to ride me and use me for the kingdom. And he said that I'd reach out to the vagabonds of the spirit that other people think are good for nothing. And as I was talking to Isaac and Rugi on, on, uh, on, on WhatsApp and they were just messaging me about Russ, they said, when are you coming back and bringing a team? And I instantly thought, are you crazy? <laughs> and God said, I called you to reach out to the vagabonds of the spirit, the ones that other people think are good for nothing. They're calling on the right person. Russ had me go to Sierra Leone because nobody would go with him. He called and said, will you go to Sierra Leone? I said, when do we leave? Why? Because Russ was asking. But I didn't realize until we were there, it's because nobody wanted to go with him. <laughs> are we willing to go where nobody wants to go? Are we willing to go? I got to tell you is... It's been hard for a lot of people that have been with us as a church, but we always attract people that, not 100% not of the people, but we attract people that other people think are a loss. I think about John. Most churches wouldn't have spent time with John. But because of that moment, John's now with the king. And I just want you to think about the reality is he spent 41 years being against the king. And yet in a moment, he beat us all there. In chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am able to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. See, Paul wants us to be blameless. We don't have to point out the failings of our government. We don't have to pull out, pull, point out the failings of our national leaders. We don't need to point out the failings of the World Health Organization or, or the UN or any of those things. You know what? They're going to they're gonna stand on their own. God's calling us to be blameless and to be a light in this darkness. It's kind of ironic because looking through those pictures, we also went to Uganda with Russ. 
And we started in the southern point and we went all the way up the eastern side of the country and did graduations, one a day for 15 days on the whirlwind tour. But along that way, you cross the equator and the equator, they just paint a yellow line across the road and it went through a store so you could buy stuff in the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. It went right through a restaurant, right across the middle of the tables. They had a yellow line and you could sit one of you in the southern hemisphere, one in the northern hemisphere. But right on the equator, they had these three bowls set up where they had water in them, and you could put water in, and they drop a, you pay them, and they drop a flower petal, and one way the water spins clockwise, and the other way it spins counterclockwise, and they're only six feet apart. But the ironic thing is they have this huge thing there you can take a picture. So while we're out there taking pictures, this UN convoy comes through, like loaded for bear. And this guy gets out of this Mercedes, and there's trucks there with guys on top with machine guns watching this guy. He had a whole entourage that jumped out of vehicles all around him and followed him. And he wasn't in a military uniform, but everybody else was in white UN uniforms. And this guy just walks up to me. And he says, will you stand here on the equator and take a picture with me? And I'm looking around. And Everybody has a machine gun. A couple of guys had really big machine guns, and everybody's looking at me, and like, you're going to tell this guy no, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, but they were actually on their way to the DRC. And I was looking at those pictures, and he's standing there with me, and you can't see, but right out of sight of the pictures, there's like 15 guys literally there with machine guns watching to make sure, you know, you put your arm around this guy, just make sure you. And I was realizing at that moment, even though I don't agree with everything the UN was doing, God brought the UN to me. And I wasn't asking them anything. He was asking, and then they were telling me, this is the general in charge of the UN in all this whole province of Africa, over like six countries. And it was just, when I was just looking at those pictures, God was showing me the ramifications of, you know, we try and speak against stuff, God was bringing them to us. You know what? God is bringing people in our life, influential people, and you know what? If we spend all our time talking against everything, we need to be loving people into, not excluding people from. The kingdom doesn't care about your nationality, about your color, about your denomination. All they care about is that Jesus is exalted. Yeah. Chapter 4, starting in verse 10, talking about God's provision. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at length that you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty of hunger, plenty, and hunger, and abundance, and need. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see what Paul's saying? Don't let your circumstances dictate your kingdom mindset. Sure, circumstances are going are to come against us. They just shut down a major oil pipeline that wasn't pumping oil yet. And if you haven't already noticed, gas prices are already going up. And I don't care if it's $50 a gallon, God's still going to provide our needs.
Back in February, we had a couple come from uh, Catch the Fire in Raleigh, and they came and taught. And why they were here is when they started shutting everything down. And they went home, and guess what? They didn't have any toilet paper. Why? Because they were here, and all of a sudden, there was a worldwide toilet paper shortage. And we're laughing, but we all know when that was going on, everybody was scrambling, thinking, what are we going to do? The awesome thing was, they went home, and they were like, oh, no, we were out of all this stuff, but we were going to do shopping when we got back, and now there's all these things you can't buy at the store. But the reality was... Other people in the church realized that they were out of town and people had stocks for them, lots of people. They went home and they had more toilet paper than anybody else because everybody else thought, I better buy them some, they're out of town. See, God provided their need before they even knew there was a need and he used others. And I'm just pointing that out because it's a very practical thing that was a very necessity for them that God provided before they even knew they needed a provision. They weren't praying and saying, God, provide toilet paper. They were saying, oh, we missed the boat on this one. And God said, no, you didn't miss the boat. You were doing what I called you to do. You went where I called you to go, and so I'm going to provide the need. And why other people, even in the church, were scrambling to find toilet paper, they had an abundance, and they were able to bless others. We can't be so short-sighted that we miss and we're not using wisely what God has for us. Amen? If you want to come up, Taylor. I don't know if we realize the times we live in. I don't know if we really fully grasp What's, what's going on in the world, what's going on even prophetically. I think it's kind of ironic that all these prophetic people across the board said all this stuff about the election, then it didn't happen. And I've read things where people said, hey, here's what all the Christian prophets said, and here's what really happened, so is your religion really true? See, people are watching things like that. We need to be careful what we do and what we say in the name of God. We need to be hearing what God is really saying. We can't be adding to it. We can't be looking at it through our own lenses. I got to tell you that God is doing something phenomenal. God is doing something so phenomenal right here in Boulder County. He started a couple years ago when the abortion doctor over there that did abortions up to the day of abortion got saved. Was standing right here and got filled with the Holy Spirit, fell down on his face and was crying out to God. See, God is changing people that nobody else wants to reach out to. God is trying to bring people in and he doesn't want us looking down on them. He wants us rejoicing in what he's doing and not condemning the people who are doing it. God has a purpose and plan, and he's going to see it come to pass. And we need to be a part of what he's doing and not be a dam in the river. We need to let the river of God flow. Just want everybody to stand right where you're at. Mm. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, for a release of 
self-condemnation that people around this room are feeling for the times they've missed it, the times they haven't stepped out, the times they've let things hold them back uh, for their attitudes, for their reactions. And Lord, I just pray right now that you would just wash over them. Lord, that you would show them that your plan has not been changed. Your plan has not been altered in any way, shape, or form. That you are here, Lord. And Lord, I pray that even now you would just blow fresh wind in what you've called them to do. That you would just blow upon them right now, Lord, in a very special and unique way. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them right now and that you would show that they were approved sons and daughters. Lord, I pray even right now that you would just show them what you would have them do and where you would have them go and, and the words that you would have them speak. And Lord, give them ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying right now. And Lord, give them eyes to see the people around them as you see them, not as we see them ourselves. Lord, I just pray for a release in each one of them right now.